Mitsubishi bought a 15% interest in Hard Creek uh, by uh, writing a check for 8 million Canadian dollars. And then um, uh, uh, Giga will operate the joint venture and uh, use the money to uh, finish up a pre-feasibility report, uh, actually two pre-feasibility reports. Hello to viewers catching this edition of Assay TV. We're with Giga Metals Corporation again to get an important update on developments with the Turnagain Nickel Cobalt Sulfide Deposit, vital for securing metals for the battery, EV and energy storage industries, of course. And I'm speaking directly with Mark Jarvis, CEO of the company. Welcome back, Mark. Hey, Adam. It's good to see you. Yeah, thanks for coming back and speaking with us. Uh, great timing because we're announcing some news today of your strategic joint venture with Mitsubishi. Congratulations on that. Why don't we dive in on uh, the details of that? Can you take us through the impacts of this and how you've brought the strategic into the project? Okay, well, first of all, the deal itself is very simple. Uh, we've created a subsidiary called Hard Creek Nickel Corp. Uh, all of the assets pertaining to Turnigan, uh, the Turnigan project are in it. And the Mitsubishi bought a 15% interest in Hard Creek uh, by uh, writing a check for 8 million Canadian dollars. And then um, uh, uh, Giga will operate the joint venture and uh, use the money to uh, finish up a pre-feasibility report uh, actually two pre-feasibility reports, one uh, sort of uh, getting into far more detail uh, on the PEA that we published last year. Um, and the other will be a bolt-on PFS level study um, to look at adding a pressure oxidation circuit. And that's really it in terms of material terms of the deal. It's uh, that simple. Um, in terms of how we got Mitsubishi on board, that's been quite a process. Uh, uh, we've been talking to them for more than three years. And, uh, you know, the, the original introduction was from our president, Martin Vidra. Right. Um, Martin is has been leading our uh, internal process to seek a strategic partner. And, um, you know, it's been, it's been a long, long slog. Uh, the discussions with Mitsubishi became more intense, say, about eight months ago. And we have been through a uh, very complete due diligence process, uh, very detailed. And uh, Mitsubishi has the capability. I mean, they're, they're involved yeah. in the mining business around the world. Uh, they're the largest uh, commodities trading company in Japan. Mm. And... Uh, but they like to own minority interests in mines and have other people operate them uh, so they can get access to the output of the mine uh, for their trading arm. So uh, they also have within the organization a bank that uh, lends money to get projects built. So really uh, just an incredible organization, incredible company. Um, and also a company that takes uh, ESG principles extremely seriously. Mm -hmm. And that's part of their attraction to our project. Yep, absolutely. We touched on a lot of good things there that I might like to lead on to. But first, let's talk just about the deal. It's, it's a great deal. I think when you're talking about having um, a JV with a strategic in the past, you're sort of looking at like 20%, but, you know, Mitsubishi have come in for 15 and you said, like the minority stake position so it's it's kind of a win-win really in that respect well it is um because part of it is is you know it validates it validates our project i mean knowing how thorough and detailed the mitsubishi team is mm. you know i don't know what other projects they've looked at because they won't you know they wouldn't tell me they would never uh, breach confidentiality they act always with the utmost honor mm. um but my guess is they probably looked at every project on the planet because that's yeah. that's the way they are. And so the fact that they've chosen us is uh, really quite a validation in my mind. Um, and then also, you know, next steps. I mean, we are looking to sell another minority interest uh, 
and this this time to perhaps a car manufacturer or a battery manufacturer, these are the people that are realizing they need to stake out long-term supplies of uh, nickel and cobalt and, uh, you know, you know, and other materials such as lithium, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, having the validation of Mitsubishi mm -hmm. uh, signing on to this thing is going to make it a little bit easier, I think, and quicker to take the next step. And, you know, and again, the next step, I think, is to get, uh, you know, someone else involved who would be an end user. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. It seems that, you know, it's always been difficult for junior mining projects, just given the early nature, early stage nature of the of the projects to, to sort of speak to OEMs and that further downstream piece. But as you say, it's these building blocks of bringing the strategic in, the mine finance provider, um, and then also the raw materials need. It's really becoming apparent for the OEMs and for the EV manufacturers. You know, we saw Stellantis, um, investing in the European project exact and they're starting to come closer now. They're starting to actually put capital in far more frequently. Yes. And and you know I think what's happened is um, the whole supply chain model is changing mm -hmm. from sort of just in time inventory, worldwide supplies, you know, the manufacturers don't own uh, you know any of the supplies coming in. They create a competition amongst their suppliers. Uh, that worked really well for a while, actually. But now the war in Europe, um, you know, the saber rattling of China around Taiwan, mm. so, uh, people are justifiably very nervous about their supply chains. And so I think there's a movement to bring the supply chains closer to home, uh, to have your sources of supply located in stable countries that aren't going to go to war on a whim. And... Mm -hmm. um, you know, and in some cases where the materials are particularly strategic to actually uh, own at least some of the supply. And uh, and so I've seen that model change just even in the last year in, 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 in our discussions with OEMs and uh, battery makers. Yep, absolutely. And I suppose just turning into the uh, Turner Game project then, what's exceptional about your project is the sort of purity of the type of nickel concentrate that you will be producing. Um, and that's why it's aligned to the battery industry, not the stainless steel industry. And that's obviously a large growth area within the overall nickel market. Um, but let's just talk about, you know, nickel within the battery chemistry, you know, LFPs obviously had a bit of um, gains in terms of the dominant use this year, but I think that's very much down to the supply squeeze that we've got, you know, the lack of quality nickel deposits. You know, I totally agree with that. I mean, uh, LFP is a good technology, but it's limited in range. You mm. know, uh, LFP batteries are heavier and they've got less energy uh, energy density than nickel-based, uh, you know, chemistries. Uh, but thank goodness for LFP, because I think without it, you couldn't really have an electric vehicle revolution. Mm. Uh, there's just not enough nickel and you can't bring enough nickel on quickly enough. Right. I mean... When I say there's not enough nickel, there is plenty of ferro-nickel in the world. There right. is no shortage of ferro-nickel, but there is a shortage of nickel that is, you know, easily and economically, um, you know, convertible to something suitable for the cathode uh, mm. users. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I just, I just think we are supply constrained. Mm. And nickel is one of the supply constraints for the EV business going forward. Yep. And the range capabilities, you know, for a North American or European consumer, it's always been the range risk that sort of slowed EVs. So you, they're going to want um, nickel batteries that give them that quality. Yes. And, and, uh, and they are, you know, like the battery makers are spending huge money on research into how to, increase the percentage of nickel uh, in the cathode. So, you know, uh, and of course the next big step, um, although it's not immediately on the horizon, will be solid state lithium ion batteries with the nickel chemistry. Yeah. And that will ab absolutely blow the doors off of the whole range question, mm. uh, you know, and the safety question as well. Mm, certainly. Okay. Um, so given what we know at this point in the 
nickel market. You know, let's talk about the um, um, the qualities of um, sorry the near term catalysts that you've got coming up that are going to be interesting for investors to pay attention to. You've mentioned the PFS and yeah. redoing some of these reports and really building on that uh, qualitative um, stack, of, stack of statements. Well, you know, I think the PFS is going to be interesting and uh, a particular interest will be the bolt-on study uh, to, uh, you know, add a pressure oxidation circuit. Um, okay. Because, you know, if you produce a concentrate at this time, really the only buyers for concentrate are smelters. Mm. And smelters are uh, an old market. They're a shrinking market. Nobody is building new smelters because they're environmentally, you know, quite horrible. <laughs> so, um, you know, and there's maybe five or six smelters in the world that will buy concentrate. Whereas if you can produce uh, MHP right now, uh, mixed hydroxide precipitates, um, mm. Well, that that form of nickel and cobalt, that chemical form, is in huge demand from battery manufacturers today. You can't produce it fast enough; it just flies off the shelves. And so, um, you know, if you, we think in five years that there's going to be hundreds of buyers for MHP. Mm. So it won't be a very small, restricted, you know, opaque market. It's going to be a wide, uh, deep, and liquid market for that form of nickel. That's what we think. And so, but the other thing about a pressure oxidation circuit is that um, you can tweak it to produce anything you want, really. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're going to be modeling MHP because that's what's hot right now. If there's other, if there's some other chemical form of nickel that is much in demand five years from now, we can tweak it. And, 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 and produce what the customers want. And I think that flexibility is uh, something that's important to the end users, uh, you know, particularly the battery manufacturers, um, to know that this is a project that can supply what they need, even if what they need changes in the next few years. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it seems to always need to change, you know, whether it's battery chemistries or the ESG criteria, and finding these more sustainable supplies, it's um, that provenance within the supply chain, which is something that, you know, given the location of your project and the process uh, to find the nickel, um, it's it, there's an advantage there. Well, the other, um, you know, very interesting development recently has been the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States. Yes, indeed. My God, what a tailwind that will provide to... Uh, projects like ours are located in Canada or in the U.S. or in any other uh, country with a free trade arrangement with the U.S. Um, it's a very clever use of you know rebates to incentivize industry to invest in mining projects, you know, more locally. So, mm -hmm. you know, I see this as a trend that was already underway, but it's now going to be accelerated by by this political act. Uh, you know, so very interesting times. And and frankly, you know, I just really get the sense that the market is coming to us. I mean, look, if, if you know, in North America, in terms of projects of this scale, uh, capable of producing, you know, in the neighborhood of 35,000 tons per year of nickel mm -hmm. for, you know, for decades, um, we are the only one that has stayed focused on the cathode. We're the only one that has stayed focused on class one nickel. All of the other projects uh, out there uh, are focused on the stainless market. And you know, we think the stainless market is extremely well supplied, whereas the battery market is not. So, you know, people talk about the uh, battery supply chain, but, you know, show me the engineering. And, I think that our project has the strength of being possibly the lowest technical risk. And that is part of what attracted Mitsubishi to us is mm -hmm. it is so simple. We have 99% of our nickel and cobalt in one mineral, pentlandite. And so, you know, all you have to do is crush the rock, grind it. And then the froth flotation needs to concentrate on floating one mineral pentlandite and suppressing everything else. 
that's why we're able to take you know a, a low grade sulfide deposit and turn it into a high grade clean concentrate um, which is very amenable you know uh, to further processing via a pressure oxidation circuit so there's just so many things going right right now i think we're at a perfect storm mm. and you know you asked earlier about um, catalysts well mm. you know stay tuned i i you know, i think the next step is going to be an oem or a battery manufacturer as part of the consortium if you will and uh you know there is a great deal of interest uh the market i feel is coming to us and uh so stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Well, Mark, thank you very much for providing the update there. Um, that's excellent to get an idea of where you are on this new trajectory. And congratulations on the JV again. And we look forward to hearing about that OEM down the line. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Adam.